we're covering it today. So rookies, we're not the <laughs> professionals. All right. So we made the countdown. How do I look on screen? Am I head heads oh, in the? Oh, we are. Yeah. Oh, here's an here's an extra camera or battery it's insurance. So welcome to today's garden class. It's basically on garden design. How do you get all the seasons? How, how do you get the mix? And what I've done for you today is I've mixed some, I've gone through and curated some plants that are for shade, for native, for more cabin. These are kind of the main three kind of designs that we go with here. Uh, and then I thought I'd go over how to put them together uh, and that kind of stuff. So we'll do that all in about an hour. So that's the goal. So my name is Ken. I'm the owner of the Garden Center. I've been doing this for 31 years now. The Garden Center actually had been in existence for 30 years already when I finally came into the business in 1992. Harold Waters had started the Garden Center back in 1962. In fact, this is our 61st spring open house. So we had it last week. It was kind of cold and windy and what great success. It, it, just, it worked still. So there was like a foot of snow on the ground like a week earlier, so I was kind of nervous. Still not warm. I mean, still kind of got that chill in the air, but plants want to go. So you can watch them. They're every day, they're opening more and more. You're not going to hold them back. It's spring next week. And so they want to go. A lot of your plants, they are triggered by temperature, but more importantly, the temperature, they're, they're, they're um, activated by day parts. So the longer the days get, it just kind of, they're just going to go because, okay, it's, there's enough daylight now. I'm all in. And spring is, it's equal day, equal dark and light, perfectly equal. That's kind of the definition of spring. And so you're seeing the forsythia starting to, to open up. You're seeing out in Prescott Valley, the uh, purple leaf plums. You're seeing the, the uh, ornamental pears. They're all starting to go all around the county. And so um, I think it's okay to plant now, as long as you're planting the spring things. Hey, Mackenzie, do you think uh, we could radio down and get the music off? They okay, perfect. It's, it's distracting me for some reason. And the dog in the back seat. So that's gonna, I just want to pet a dog all of a sudden. <laughs> so I've been on my own for like 10 days now. Lisa is in Poland, my wife. She's with grandkids visiting their family. And our boy was deployed to Poland. He's in the army. So he's right on the Ukraine Polish borders, kind of as a defense thing. So if you're, pray, if you're a prayer kind of person, pray for James. We want him safe and all the other soldiers, but mainly focus on James, that kind of stuff. <laughs> She's going to go visit and that kind of stuff. Uh, so anyway, I get her back, I think, on Thursday. I can't wait. So I'm taking care of dogs and cats. And, and we had a consultant in yesterday, kids, and business. Usually we do divide and conquer kind of stuff. So not, not, this, not this week. So let's go over how much of each season that you need. When you're designing your gardens, you really need 20% of your landscape plants dedicated to spring bloomers. Those are your lilacs and forsythia, things that are starting to open up right now. They announce spring. And so purple leaf plums, red buds, and we'll show you some of those things in a second. You need 20% of your landscape dedicated, the plants dedicated to Summer bloomers, you've got to have that summer show. You're out there, that's roses, Rose of Sharon, crepe myrtles, chaste tree, there's uh, desert willows. These are all things that bloom. They have no interest in spring. It's too cold for them. They like, they like the heat, you know, like put a Speedo on, go out there, lay on the beach and just soak up the sun. Those are your summer plants. They love that. That's what they want. You need 20% of your landscape dedicated to fall color. That's going to be your aspens, your maples, uh, things that just turn, you know, burning bush. A lot of these spring bloomers and summer, summer bloomers, they'll also turn fall color, but you want to be more st strategic with it because a lot of those summer plants, especially the deserty kind of ones, they just go from green to brown. I don't think brown is a fall color. I think, I think red, orange, yellow, golds, those are all fall colors. And then 20%, and you're feeling this right now, should be dedicated to evergreens. That is, in the middle of winter, it's January, and there's a blizzard outside. It's got its foliage, so it looks good. If you get that off, it'll feel barren. It feels open. It feels like there's something lacking. Those are your anchors that hold the landscape all together no matter what. 
The last 20% is whatever you want it to be because you're gardeners. I don't want to hold you back. If, you're, if this is your summer home and you're coming up from Scottsdale and this is where you camp out, focus on the summer plants. If this is your winter home, so we got a lot of Minnesota, Alaska, Wisconsin folks, they winter down here, snowbirds. Focus on the winter evergreens, the winter bloomers, like uh, camellias, and a whole series of things that bloom really, really early. So before you head back home and things have thawed, you've enjoyed all that, that color and evergreens when you're here. Makes sense? So 20, spring, summer, fall, winter, whatever you just done, whatever tickles your fancy, okay? 60%, that's the magic number. When, you're t when they teach you this in design school, it's 60% of your landscaped, your property should have softscape on it. Those are living, breathing things. That's, that's trees, shrubs, plants, perennials, flowers, 60%. That includes a rooftop, the driveway. So, but, but it kind of fools you because a, a tree is like a huge canopy. So that's your core that covers most of it. If you get too many plants in there, um, it feels like a jungle. Um, feels overgrown, feels like you just want to, like something's going to jump out and, and grab you. If you get too little, you only have 50% foliage, you'll feel it because you'll walk on that property and it'll feel kind of dusty or lunar or just feels, God, what do they do, run out of money and they put it all in their home and there's not enough to decorate or have some color or greet you when you come in. So that's if for your properties. That's where you're living. Now for my rentals and stuff, I'm going with maybe less. More rock, easier care, because tenants don't care about as much as a homeowner that's living right there taking care of it. Gardeners, you all are gardeners. So you're gonna take care of it more. You're more prone to put too many plants in, and now it's overgrown. Uh, if you bought that last house in the development, the, uh, design, the, the, uh, the developers that are selling those model homes, they overplant it on purpose, because they're trying to get that feel. They're trying to have you come in and go, Oh, I would really like to live here. The problem is they overplanted it, and now you bought it, and three years later, it's overgrown. So you might have to thin out some of those plants. Actually, break a chainsaw out and kill them. I know this is hard for you all. It's okay to take out a tree, take it out if it's not looking good. If it's too much, it just doesn't feel right. Take it out. Uh, you bought that house that uh, the previous owner maybe was there a little older. They couldn't take care of, they were a gardener, but they couldn't take care of the last seven, eight, 10 years. And it kind of just got overgrown. You may need to really go in it and, and thin those things out and remodel, clear it out to get it feeling like it's not overgrown like a jungle. So your seasons, 20% plus anything you want. Um, and then 60%, if you get those, that alone will make your, your landscapes just feel and look better. Um, Planting season is now. Actually, we're so mild, we plant year round. So we had a frost line, that's where the ground freezes for a couple inches, only for a few days, and then it thawed right back out and we were, we were planting the evergreens. Just the seasons will change. So right now I've got a heavy mix at the garden center of spring blooming things. Because I know you're gonna be walking through, the, through your neighborhoods going, oh my gosh, what is that? That's a lilac. Every yard should have at least three. I mean, they're fragrant, they're beautiful, they're drought hardy, they're just easy care, things don't eat them. They're great for here. I know some of these, the Southern California folks, some of the folks from other warmer climates, they've never seen a lilac. And they're gonna look at those and go, oh, I want one. And I've got them for you. I've got a, a very large selection right now of every size, every color, every as we transition from spring to summer, I'll have maybe one variety, like the common lilac, well, the one that your grandparents grew, I'll have that one. But I won't have the white and the yellow and the variegated and the red with the, all the magical ones. I'll run out of dwarf ones that repeat bloom. Those, I've got a couple hundred of them and they, when they're gone, there's no more. So there's actually a series that we're coming out with that bloom and then repeat, bloom, like a rose. It'll bloom and then bloom again. So mine bloomed three times last year. Um, so, but then in the summer, I'll have all the crepe myrtles and all the Rosa Sharon's and all the other summer things that are just magical, just kind of inspiring, kind of will have all those. So you'll see this crop rotation is what we call it. We've strategically planned 
all the all the plants that they're coming in when they when they look their best. That's why it's really good to shop your garden center seasonally, so you can see what the best you've got the most uh, hydrangea uh, choices in May, around Mother's Day, May and June. That's when the most varieties and colors. I'll have the new purple one out. You're going to hear all about purple hydrangeas. I was able to secure a few of them, so I've got some and the traditional blues, whites and pinks. Um, the the uh, fall color stuff. Uh, number one seller by far, maples. Uh, so you folks in the Midwest, you need to be a little bit careful because you're that's maple country. Not every maple does great here because of our sun and our wind. Uh, it kind of tears them up. So your Acer Rebrum, the traditional one from the Midwest, that's red maples, traditional five leaf to it. That one tends to get wind torn or wind whipped. So it, it tears up and so it looks kind of rough until it gets some real girth to it, real size, then it starts to protect itself. A better choice would be autumn blaze maple. It's a variation of reds where it takes that wind, it doesn't tear the leaves up. But you still get that bright like fire engine red, uh, shade tree kind of size that you would expect a maple to be. Something to watch is our sun is more intense. We're up at elevation, we're a mile high, um, and, and you folks in Paulden, you're no different than Chino Valley. You're no different. I know Prescott Valley thinks they're special. You're no different than Prescott. We're all in this thing together. We're all the same. So the sun is, is pretty intense. The water is very alkaline. We all have wind. So you're going to have, those are the variables we're dealing with. The wind is more intense. So this is like uh, Southern Californians. They love their Japanese maples. And I've got Japanese maples. If you read the tag, it says, grows out in full sun, takes our wind, does great. Not at this elevation. It doesn't like our sun that midday in June, oh, it just beats it up. So it's, they do better when they're a little bit protected uh, from, let's say, morning sun. That's great. At midday in June, when it's hot and dry, that's pretty rough. And so the, the, the tree will grow but it will look terrible and you'll hate it because it'll have burned leaves. It doesn't grow like it grows at, at a lower elevation. Uh, some of you folks in, in, uh, from the Midwest, you're used to your geraniums. Full sun right up the whole yard, full of geraniums. Well, they will grow out here in full sun, but I find they bloom longer and better and they got some protection. Give them six, seven hours, but at midday in June, they, just, they, go, they bloom for a day and then go out of bloom. So you'll find that your placement will be a little bit different you might have to play with it, and that's where you come and talk to us. Uh, our website, uh, if you want a shortcut to the plants, top 10, like the number 10 plants.com. When they come into the dock, we put them up on our website, and then we're describing them how they grow here, how much water they need here, how much wind they take here, the description of how tall they get here. We're not taking the national tag. We're going, oh, maples grow 50 feet tall in, in uh, Ohio. Here, they only grow 35, so we're giving you those, those uh, they tend to dwarf a little bit here. The leaves will be a little smaller, too, because it's so arid, so it's the dryness. So when they're starting to f just come out, eventually we're going to dry up here, and there won't be, it's just, just talking to me, just let me know, just kind of, yeah, I feel the same way. Uh, anyway, <laughs> um, the dryness tends to dwarf things more than maybe you're used to in other parts of the country. So uh, we're going to dry out here. We've only got one or two storms left, and then we won't see moisture again until monsoons. First part of into June, July, somewhere in there. So it, May and June are actually the hardest months to grow things. It's the most popular. It's one of the hardest because we have this prevailing southwest wind. It just blows. It's 10% humidity. I think it's only measuring 10% because that's as low as the gauge goes. I actually think it goes lower. Like it's dry, you can feel your skin dry out. Yet the plants are starting this new growth coming out. They got these tender new leaves, tender new candle growth for your evergreens. So they're more sensitive. You gotta be more accurate with your watering right then. It's really, really critical. If your lilacs are starting to go into bloom or your forsythia or flowering quince, the things that bloom, when they're in bloom or if they're in fruit, uh, they're real sensitive to water. You want to make sure you get that spot on. Otherwise, they'll shed their flowers or they'll drop their fruits. So just kind of be aware. Once that summer hits, they tend to harden off. The monsoon rains come in July. They just The humidity goes up. 
kind of the pressure's off. In fact, if anything, right then, you're starting to overwater things because you've been trying to keep things moist through June. It's hot. It's dry. You're just trying to just get things to live in June. You don't need them to look good. You just want them to survive. When the monsoon rains come and you give them a little bit of fertilizer, you can get a whole nother set of growth. Whole nother, some of the best roses are right then. They, they don't have all the thrip and aphid damage. They just have this heat loving, they just do really well then. That's when your, your lavenders just go crazy right then because they love that. So you wanna adjust your clock a little bit on that irrigation or adjust your, how, you, how often you're watering and I'm, this isn't really a watering class, but I'll touch on it real quick because everyone's starting to ask. Uh, in fact, I sent you, Mackenzie, the, uh, the links that I want to share to the class. In fact, I'll, I'll share that here. I have three handouts for you. So things that we're covering today, I wrote a two page is here's how you design locally. I'll, it's easy, easy read. I'm going to send that to you. And then I was just talking to a, a, a ladies group, PEO group. Um, bunch of gals that raise money for scholarships for, for young women. Great cause. Went up to speak to them. And I took them a uh, plants that attract butterflies and hummingbirds. And they all just went, oh, oh my God, that's great. I thought I'd give that to you too because it went over so well on that one. And then I got to give you the plants that the javelina are less likely, not proof, less likely to eat or, or dig up or, or have a problem. So I got three things for you today. Those are the three. And I'll just email those to you directly from my desktop to yours. If you're part of our garden club, it's not going to everyone. It's only going to students here. And then you folks online, we're listing those links down in the, in the chat bar over to the right-hand side. You can download those at your convenience. Okay, so I'll, I'll send uh, this around. And if you could, um, put your first and last name down too and your email address, some of your handwriting is atrocious. <laughs> it's really hard to interpret. And then I'll, I'll try to go, and some, cause, but your names seem to correlate somewhat to your email. So it kind of helps me kind of guesstimate right. Um, here's that for you. Let me see if I have another pin here. Why don't you have that go around with it? Just so those folks that maybe don't have a pin, they can write with it. Okay, so there's the, who's brand new there? This is your first garden season here in, in the, great. So now who's been here only like since the new year? Like since January, you moved here since January. One, real, two in the back here. I'm gonna give you a, uh, I'll give you the butterfly and hummingbird handout that I'm gonna send. Everyone will get this, Not, don't, you're special too. Just thought I'd make the, you seem like a javelina guy. I'm going to give you the, the uh, list of non-javelinas. And then right over here, I'll give, uh, so I balance it out. There's the design, how to do it. Those, those are the handouts I'm going to give out to you later today. So just, you'll have it, PDF form. Any, any iPad, desktop can open it, and any printer can print it. Okay, so it'll be easy for you to use. Okay, where was I at? Season, oh, watering, it's gonna cover that on watering. So you activate your irrigation on average, April sometime, whenever it starts to dry out, you, you turn it on. You're probably going to walk it to make sure gophers, pack rats, things didn't eat. The, the, you, wanna make, you wanna tune up your irrigation every spring before you turn it on. Already I see I've got an elbow where water kind of settled and it cracked. So it's an easy fix. $2 fix, but if I just ran it and turned it on without looking at it, it would just flow down the, just because come an issue, okay? And then uh, you're running that through October, usually the end of October. You'll, you'll feel fall is there, the last of the Bradford pears are turning red in, in color. You're going, oh, it's definitely the pumpkins, you're kind of getting tired of looking at them. Moms are still in bloom. That's about your cue. Uh, it's probably time to turn it off. We're turning it off so that it doesn't freeze. Now, with that being said, you do need to water through winter here, usually. So this has been an unusually wet winter, very unusual. It's like record breaking. This is not normal. So many times we can have no moisture 
kind of November, December, January, and finally we'll get some storms. You can go long periods without it moisture. You'll need to water a couple times a month, even through winter, even when the system's off, even November, December, January, February, you'll, you'll need to water a couple times just to take the edge off. And so when a plant is dry and it gets real wet, that's when it gets damaged. That's when we, we have what's called winter kill. So the tops, the top of the branches will, will die back, especially on evergreens, like broadleaf evergreens, like uh, red tip photinia, uh, cotone asters, euonymus, these evergreen shrubs that have leaves on them, they're prone, really prone. They're still using moisture, not a lot, but some. And so I do a lot of container gardens myself. Uh, I've had a couple back surgeries. So most of my garden's done in raised beds or containers. It's just easier for me. It's just, I can control everything with that. Uh, if I have a container and I see the, the weatherman says it's gonna be really cold, I will go ahead and water everything before the cold gets there. I'll do that with my landscape too. If I need to water and I haven't watered yet, uh, the damage done to plants, if they're dry, going into real cold snaps. That's when you get damaged. That's when they get killed off. If you hydrate them, keeps all that antifreeze with, within the structure of that plant. Plants have naturally occurring antifreeze. It keeps all that fluid so it kind of protects itself. That's kind of a little insider tip that'll help you have more success for, for those winter things, okay? Let me think here. What else can I give you? I got so much and to pack it all in in just a few minutes is hard. All I want you to do is get a few good you can get three good tips with one class. That's all I'm really after. That'll help you go forward successfully. That's my goal. Why don't we go down some of the uh, plants, some of the plant mixes I had for you. So some of you have really north, south, east, west. Some of you have just sun, exposed wind. It's just rough on these ridge lines. Beautiful vistas. Oh boy, that wind can whip and it just dries things out. And the sun is intense. Some of you up in the, in the uh, uh, forests, pine trees everywhere, you can't find a, a sunny spot on your lot. It's just shade everywhere. And then everything in between. Uh, what I find is you've get, it's, it's more, it has more to do with your, your exposure. Is it east exposure, north, south, west? The south gardens are just, just hot. They're just hot. And we've got a prevailing southwest wind that comes and so they're really hot and windy. Um, those are the hardest if you get the plants wrong. They're the easiest if you get the plants right. My best garden, just me, my name's Ken. We're just gardeners talking over the fence. This, my best gardens are always on the east. The east, east gardens are, um, even if it gets cold, that sun pops up and warms those gardens up really quick. Uh, in the peak of summer, it heats them up real quick and then it gives them some rest, some shade. So the definition of full sun is six hours or more is equals full sun. At this elevation, full sun is six hours or more. Under six hours, that's gonna be defined more of a shade kind of plant, a shade garden. Yeah, it, can, it might get some sun in the, late in the, in the day as the sun goes down, but that's pretty kind. The sun is pretty, pretty low on the horizon, so it's, that sun is not as intense. And that's during the growing season. April through October. So six hours or more during the growing season or six hours or less, that's gonna define full sun or, or, or shade kind of plants. So with that being said, I guess I should cover two zones. Where's zone seven? There you go, you got it. Uh, look up for more, but zones, you can grow zone seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. So that and lower, you can grow. And that's a cold hardiness. So you need plants and go down to 10 degrees uh, or lower. So, so lilacs, they go down to like minus 30 degrees. We've never seen minus 30 degrees, but it'll grow here and never be damaged. You can also grow things that can go to 10 degrees and you need plants that can go cold. So let me just get it out here. You cannot grow citrus here. Just write it off your list. You cannot have it. You're too high. You cannot grow avocado. I'm tired of people asking Tucson, Palm Springs, when can I have citrus? You can't. But you can have apples, pears, cherries, peaches, apricots, nectarines. Grow what, what, grow in your yard what's up here. Uh, and you'll have, you'll struggle less. Um, and that's when do some homework, ask us, and we can help guide you. Um, 
We have a strong belief we are not selling plants. We're selling successful garden projects. We want this thing to produce fruit. We want it to thrive and bloom a long time. If, if it does that, you're going to be happy and you're going to come back and garden with us more. If it dies slowly, there's nothing more torturous to a gardener than watching a plant slowly fade over six weeks. And finally, that's just like, that's what, if you do, you go to the bad place, that's what they do to gardeners. They just give them plants for free and they watch them die slowly. That's just, we don't want that for you. We want what's better for you. Okay, so let's start with shade. We'll kind of work this way to native stuff, kind of go in between. If you got, well, we'll see how we can do. We're half hour in. Let's start with this one. Let me get my chair. Do I have my chair? I don't have my chair. Let me just pull this chair up. Yeah, I'll just do this. Just kind of show it off for those folks on camera. We're trying to make sure you got front row seat so you tune in and can hear everything and see everything. So this is one that's surprising to folks. This is a rhododendron. This is a dwarf rhododendron. It likes the shade. So I would say six hours or less of sun. And I would say if it's not in that midday in June, this is when this, this plant will thrive. As long as you keep it out of that midday sun, it will thrive. And it does this every spring guaranteed without just with ease. The beauty with rhododendrons is animals don't eat them. Deer, elk, rabbits, javelina, they don't like the taste, look, flavor of rhododendrons. So you can put them right out there in the forest have a pack of deer go by, and they're not going to bother it. Havelina might dig it up just for fun, but they wouldn't eat it. They're just doing it for fun. They pass it around the yard like a, like a soccer ball or something. They just leave it there hanging out in the yard, but generally they leave them alone. You'll see some very beautiful ones out in the forest. Uh, you can grow this in containers. Um, it likes that shade. So my, my north side, the, the uh, patios where we entertain at our house, it's a north side. So it's very pleasant in, in the summer. It's two-story house, actually two and a half. It's kind of way up there, so it's lots of shade. Uh, and this plant just thrives back there. Okay, rhodes, azaleas, uh, camellias. These are all plants that like the shade on that, on that north side. This is another one that people are surprised by. This is very fragrant. It just opened up this week. This is Pieris, or lily of the valley, shrub. So this, get, this is fully mature. This is how big it gets. Um, it has white flowers. I've got some with red flowers, pink flowers. It varies, but basic green foliage, white flowers. This is the common one. Loves the shade. Fragrant for the shade. This is one that's great to have on that covered patio in a pot because it is so fragrant. It will just fill up that, that back patio for like an entire spring season. It's amazing. So, and then this is his winter color. It's, it'll get a little bit of yellow, but it'll start coming out. As soon as it's done blooming, pushes more green foliage. and just gets this nice, tight, full shrub. So, literally the valley for shade. No more than six hours. Where it is not going to be happy. You know, we can't, we can grow real. So, the question was, can we grow real, little, the bulbs, uh, literally the valleys, real short little uh, white flower. Uh, they struggle. It's alkalinity. There's probably better choices for, for that. Hollies, um, hollies do surprisingly well. Now, on the East Coast, this grows in full sun. Here, it gets burnt. The tips of the, of the leaves get burned. It looks pretty beat up if it's out in full sun. I think it does better in part sun. So no more than six hours, I would say. Classic red berries. This is the one that screams holidays, just holidays. Many times I'll take one home and just put it by the front door. I don't even pot it. I just put this by because it's so, it's so doggone pretty. And then when it's all done, I'll go plant it in a pot or something outdoors. So in the East Coast, you make hedgerows and back fence walls. You soften things up in full sun. Here, there's probably better choices. We'll show you what those are than a holly for here. Okay. Several varieties of hollies. Oh, the other one, too. If you've ever grown hollies, hollies have males and females. The females are the pretty ones. Those are the ones you want. Voluptuous. They bury up. They just look pretty. You can tell they're, they're females. The males are scraggly, ugly, 
rangy things you kind of put over there. And they, but they, but you need those to populate the gals so they put on the berries. So we've actually grafted, or we have the male and the female in the same plant. So now you only you, need, you only need one plant instead of, you know, usually we'd put five or six females, and then we put one scraggly male over here to, to make sure all the gals put berries on. Now we figured out how to do it with just one plant. So we're getting smarter with this stuff. But that's the one. That's a definitely a female holly because it's full of berries. That's kind of what you want for holly for. Okay, number one selling evergreen by far. Alberta spruce. If you want this, what we use these for is the coming up to your house and the pillars on either side or in a pot on either side of the garage. Um, this is a small, slow growing plant. It only gets up about as tall as you and I. It can get kind of chubby, kind of like this. But basically it looks like a Christmas tree. This has never been sheared. This is just how it grows. When it's this big, it will just look like a Christmas tree that's this big, just without any care to it. And so this will grow in the shade, grows in the sun. It'll grow wherever you want to grow it. It seems to be pretty easy care. Uh, and evergreens, they just naturally, we, we're surrounded by pine forests, spruce, fir. Evergreens naturally grow here. So I, they just adapt really well. In fact, most evergreens, in fact, all, let me think here. Yeah, if you're going to kill evergreens, it'll be from overwatering. Our heavy clay soil, especially as you get up that 69 corridor, you get up by Hills Ranch, all the way out to, to I-17. It's just caliche layers. It's heavy clay layers out there. And if you hit one of those, water just pools, gathers up in the soil, and you, you kill things. So if we run into that, what we'll do is we'll take a digging bar or jackhammer, try to fracture that so that it, once you crack that, it's like a, it looks like concrete. Really, it's got a chalky kind of gray layer to it. That's caliche. You've never really dealt with that until you moved here in the Southwest, but it's not your friend. You want to, usually we'll dig what we call it a chimney. We'll take a chunk out until we see the next layer soil band, and then it will all of a sudden start perking or start draining and things will start living. If you just plant it on top of that caliche layer, that's that's a problem. Another one is we'll get bold like uh, um, up Copper Basin, that, that side of, of town, there's lots of boulders in the rocks, in, in the soil. So you'll be digging there and all of a sudden you hit this, <laughs> some of you poor folks, by the time you get dug, you get this huge like thousand pound boulder you're trying to roll out of the way. Uh, if you hit a big rock shelf, a big boulder underneath that, you don't really see it, you'll dig that hole and the, the plants it, that hole just will not perk. That water is sitting on top of that granite layer. And so you go, why won't that plant, why won't things grow there? That's usually what's going on. So if you're in doubt, if you're in the valley areas, let's say Poland to Chino to, 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 to Prescott Valley, those are hard clays, most of them. And so those poor, those new areas of Chino Valley, it's really hard and you got little tiny, like potato sized rocks everywhere. So those, that's hard clay. If you're digging a hole and it seems like it's thick and heavy, test the, test the planting hole first. If you fill it up in the morning with water, that, that planting hole, and water is still sitting there in that hole at the end of the day, you, can, you can't garden in that. You, you dug a bathtub. Just <laughs> dig, continue, dig a spa. I mean, put, a, put some bubbles in there because it's not going to grow plants until you modify it and get to the next soil band. Usually when you hit the next soil, you'll see soil come in, in layers. Once you dig down and get to the next soil layer, it'll all of a sudden start, start growing stuff. The other little secret I found is just some garden mistakes I've made. Um, out in those heavy clay areas, leave about that much of the, of the root out of the ground. So literally leave, leave like that much out of the ground. And then slowly feather, have your soil, you're planting on a slight mound. So take that soil and kind of feather it out so it's kind of slowly, so it looks like it's on a very, you'll, you'll be the only one that can see it's on a mound. What that does for you is in the, in, in the rainy, rain, August, September, October, it's real wet and rainy. Um, no matter how much moisture we get, it's going to make sure that plant breathes. At least that much of the roots can breathe 
no matter how much monsoon rain or wet we get. It seems like we kill plants in March and during the monsoon, like August, September, because it's we're just wet. In March, we get these heavy, wet, gooey snows. They just sit there for a few days and the plants can't breathe for a week and a half and they get root rot. So that's when you'll do damage. So that guarantees at least that much of the roots can breathe. So it'll, it'll adjust. Plants want to live if you help them. Whatever you do, for the love of gardening, don't listen to any garden advice that comes out of Phoenix. So to everything you've learned down there, just erase, reboot, start over, because it doesn't work. One thing they tell you to do is plant in a divot. You want a rain harvest. You want to make sure, oh, when you're living 10 miles from the sun, you can do that. It's 110 out at dinner time. That's just, who lives down there? That's crazy. Come up to God's country. You got to be kidding me! Down there, you can you can you can have a divot and plant there and help it water. Up here, you don't want to do that because of the monsoons. So you're going to water in the morning typically, and then you get an afternoon rain. All of a sudden, that plant can have three or four days of just they can't breathe. So, if anything, you want to do the opposite: plant on a slight mound. It, it'll it'll up your game. I mean, dramatically. Really? Already? Yes. Okay. Slope is, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, great question. Yeah, so she's on a slope for you folks online over here. So, so what happens, slopes naturally drain anyway. So you're, I would say that doesn't matter so much. There you're actually uh, probably digging out the side of a hill trying to get some water to, 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 to anyway, just to water it easier. Um, what I'll do, let me just show you, let me get, not this one, let me get this. This is a good example here. So erosion control for slopes, that's a problem. We're taking what we call riprap, stacking rocks up. So the, the industry calls it riprap. We stack rocks up to just hold the hill in. It still washes away sometimes. So we'll put some plants in. Plants are the best at holding, holding soil together because all those roots go in and they just stick there. Um, this is a classic one. This is a ground cover or carpet junipers. Um, this is actually called Windfall, Windwalker is the actual variety, but any kind of creeping, cotoneasters, creeping plants, creeping junipers, things that crawl, um, they're great for slopes like that. The, the lesson is everyone wants to dig out the side of the hill and make this great big, they, they make work out of planting, they just dig into the side. Now it looks, we, looks like we have little teacups or, or pockets dug into the, what I do is I'll plant it, if the hill's like this, I'll plant this like this, so it looks like it grew right out of the hill, and then I'll put the irrigation at the top side of the hill up here, and it will naturally water, if you're doing it by, by drip irrigation. It'll make it look more natural, and it's just as effective at, at taking care of watering that plant. Um, anyway, it's just some, something I would do also, when you're running your irrigation, this is kind of, I'm a, I'm a irrigation contractor. Don't run your, your half inch main distribution line up this way, because gravity is not gonna help you. It's gonna, it's gonna hinder. You wanna run your irrigation line sideways so the gravity is more consistent. The, as water gets, goes downhill, it gains weight. So the water, the emitters at the bottom of the hill will run faster than the top. The top ones will almost not run at all. But if you run that irrigation main distribution line like this, Sideways, horizontally, you're good to go. Just some, some things that'll help you really quick. And you'll do some internet search, you'll probably tell you that, but you search the internet anymore. I don't care if you got chat bots or AI helping you, it's darn confusing. Like, what's true, what's real, I have no idea. I think UFOs just landed, I don't know. Okay, where are we at, shrub? Here, I wanted this one. This is another holly I brought, just unusual. I like this one because it's called Sky Pencil. Just grows really tight and tall. Okay, it'll get up. It's really pretty in pots with some pansies around the front. You just do, uh, do I have those? I don't think I brought up here. Ta-da, there's a garden. I don't know, it just looks good, instantaneous in a big pot on a patio, it just looks good. Uh, pansies are violas and pansies. These are winter bloomers. They like to bloom now. They like frost 
every night. Give them a light dusting of snow. They're happy. They don't like summer heat. Once this plant gets up to about 90 degrees, I don't care how much water you give it, it is going to vaporize before your eyes. And usually in one day, you'll go off to work or you're going to go work out the gym. You come back in the afternoon and it's dead, just like that. But it likes to be planted in the fall, fall or, or very early spring, late winter. It likes to be when it's cold. I find that the folks make mistakes with this. They're going to come in in May. They're going to look for flowers because May is flower, flower season. They're going, oh, I've been seeing these pansies bloom all winter long. Oh, I want some of those. And they'll get that last crop of, of pansies that I've got or violas. Um, and they'll plant them. And then three or four weeks later, they vaporize in the summer heat. And they're going, oh, I'm just, I'm just not a gardener. You're a gardener. You just, you just got the last. You should have planted them back in March. Or what I do, I plant them back in September and October. So they'll bloom right through winter. Literally that snow we had, what, 10 days ago? I just pulled the snow off the top of my pansy. They were still in bloom. Yay, I'm happy. They were, they were good with that. They like the winter. So you'll find right now you've got your spring plants. They like the spring. Plant those. Stay, you'll be tempted to plant zinnias or geraniums or the summer things. They have no interest. They get damaged by the, by the spring cold. So tomatoes are the biggest one. Vegetable gardening started. So you can plant potatoes now successfully. You can plant lettuce now successfully. All the, all the leafy things, you're, you're uh, harvesting the, the flowers like, like uh, cauliflower or broccoli. You can, you can plant those now. Uh, things that form a fruit, cucumbers, eggplants, tomatoes, peppers, squash, those are summer plants. They do not like frost. And so we'll generally plant those at the end of April, May, because we're getting past our last frost. Those are summer things. So just be careful, you new folks, so half the class is new. Our frost date is May 8th. Prescott Valley is totally different. They're May 6th. So basically we're all the same frost date. We all get the same. It's just a couple days difference. So I had some old ranch friends tell me, yep, you don't plant until you see the snow gone from the mountaintops. That's another way to check. So you can kind of look to see. So just know, be ready to cover things with frost cover or something if you're going to plant early. Like I'm going to plant a tomato plant in the yard this weekend. It's a month early. But I got a radio show. I've got a garden column. There's, there's bragging rights with gardeners. Like you got to get out. In July, I want to come on the radio going, you know, I picked my first tomato and it was so good. How are yours doing? I mean, there's this, there's this tension that gardeners have with each other at cocktail parties and sipping and watching the sunset. We want to, we want to brag about our stuff. I'm going to put it in a little uh, plant protector. There's little tiny greenhouses, basically. You can put around these. And I'll start one or two of them just so I can get a start, but I won't commit everything until May. Then I'll go for, for the whole garden. Anyway, that's just me. You can start early. And some of you cheat completely. You've got greenhouses and all kinds of stuff. So that's just not even, that's not even right. That's totally cheating. Okay. What's that? Yeah, well, yeah. This is, yeah. Okay. This does help me sleep at night in the spring because I've got, I don't know how many, a lot of money in inventory right now. And I fear that of, there's two things that get me is frost and hail in the summer. They can vaporize your inventory. So you just want, these are there to, really make it more pleasant for you to shop. This is a way impractical to actually heat. We don't heat this house. It's just there to keep the frost off and keep the hail off of, of flowers and stuff. Anyway, yes. Let's go to the, the, the kind of cabin, uh, more traditional, I guess, type of, of home. And so lots and lots of forest kind of stuff, landscapes. And so this is one that's just got to go there. This is Mugo pine. It's a shrub, a pine tree, pine shrub. It's not a tree. It just gets about this hip high and kind of mounds like this. Nothing bothers it. Nothing eats it. Takes full blistering sun. Take a blow dryer to it. It's still happy. It's, it's, it's good with our, our, it grows up here, but it's a, it's a relative to ponderosas and pina pines. 
just naturally going to do really well. You can grow this in, in raised beds, containers, right out there in the yard. It's great at putting down the driveway, kind of lining things. It's a great little landscape accent to shrub. Gets about hip high. Yeah. This is probably the most popular of all the California plants. Californians love this. They call it heavenly bamboo. The rest of the country calls it Nandina. So this is a Nandina heavenly bamboo. I brought this because there's so many varieties. Uh, we probably have right now at the garden center six or seven varieties. And it's about how tall they get. So you got the standard one that's, that gets its name, heavenly bamboo. looks like a bamboo plant. And then it gets too big for a lot of places. So now we've got Sienna Sunrise, Gulf Stream, Harbor Dwarf. What I brought this for is, you'll notice this has got quite a bit of red on it. This particular plant is an evergreen shrub. So it will hold its foliage right through winter. But if it's exposed to a lot of sun, full sun, it'll turn this bright red, like, like fire engine red. And the more sun it gets, the redder it gets. If it's in the shade, it stays more green. It doesn't get as much, give it a red tinge to it, but it really stays green. So you'll see plants, depending on how much sun they get, it'll change the characteristics of how they look. Uh, here in another two, three weeks, it'll just green right up, just be solid green. Okay, Nandina. Number one selling plant in the country. Anyone know what this is? Boxwood, everyone knows what this is. It's boring. I've sold thousands of them, but it's a top seller because it's green. This is what you get in the winter. This is what you get in the spring. This is what you get all the time. This is what they line uh, English gardens with. They hedge them down to knee high and stuff. This is, that's, that's boxwood. I've got three or four, four varieties, different heights uh, because it's so tough. The other beauty of this is out in the forested areas, no animals bother this. So it's got a lot going on for it. I just wish it would go in the dark, have flowers like this on it, do something. This is just what you're going to get. Green, 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 beautiful green all the time. Okay. We'll use this a lot in containers as the anchor. And they'll put flowers in front of it or surround it kind of stuff. Uh, walk, lining driveways to the front door. That's how you use this. So good plant for your... Very good. You'll also know it's got a real waxy leaf to it. So waxy leaves, as you touch and feel the plants, if it's got a thicker or waxier leaf, that means it's drought hardy. That is, it'll take the, it just doesn't perspire, like let's say a thinner type of, of, of leaf to it. So this is, this is, I wouldn't call it a native, but it adapts, it's really easy to take care of, okay? Another one, just while we're on that lesson, this is the one we put in a lot of seed mixes, wildflower seeds. This is a great perennial plant. Perennials come back year after year. So perennial and permanent, you know, once and done kind of stuff. That's a perennial. Annuals are, they bloom for one year and then they die. They might reseed or something, but basically that root, it's, it's gone. This is a perennial, it comes back year after year. Long bloom cycle. Um, full sun gets about this tall, kind of mounds like this and it's always, if you, if you deadhead this throughout the season, it will be nonstop blooms from April through October. It's an amazing perennial. If you take a close look at this, maybe after the class, you'll see all the foliage, even the stems of the flowers have this hair to it, have a follicle, have a texture to it. That's a defense this plant puts on it to keep animals away from it. So when animals eat this, they kind of go, oh man, what are all those hairs? I can't take this. And they move on and eat something else. They don't, bother, javelina don't bother this. Rabbits don't bother this. Gallardia, or blanket flower is a common name. That's a great little plant. Um, this is called Arizona Sun. It's an Arizona plant. It's just a great little plant for your, flowers are a little small yet because they just opened up, but they'll actually get about bigger than a silver dollar. Can you even say that? When's the last time you saw a silver dollar? <laughs> you see more Bitcoin than you do silver dollars anymore. Do they even make them anymore? I have no idea. Random thoughts, I haven't either, but I hear about them all the time. Okay, so we're going down this way. Um, this one here is a red bud. It's one of the first ones to bloom in spring. This would be one of those spring bloomers. So red buds have a heart-shaped leaf to it like this. And we're trying to introduce more and more of them. 
because they're native to Arizona. There's a, there's a native variety that grows here called Western red buds. So all the red buds do really well here. Western tends to be a little short, tiny leaves. So even the bigger leaf, the Eastern red buds or variations thereof, or sometimes we've, we've, we've grafted them together. You get the hardiness, they take the wind, they get up to about mid-teens, 15, 18 feet, somewhere. This is a short tree compared to, let's say a 70 foot sycamore or cottonwood. They just get huge. This guy is not gonna be invasive with roots, just easy to care for. The fall color on this is gold, kind of an aspen kind of gold color to it. This is a really pretty tree and it announces, and it's from the pea family. So and you should try it when you get a chance, if you're brave enough, the flowers are edible. They're really sweet. They taste really good. So you can put them on top of salad. If you want to wow your garden friends, have the girlfriends come over, just sprinkle some uh, red bud flowers on it. They're, they're delicious, actually. Okay, so that's just starting to open up. This is probably the most famous. This, this announces spring right now. You're, this is starting to bloom all over, all over the county. This is forsythia. So four, like forsythia. Uh, it's a shrub about like this. You can easily keep it trimmed down to here, but kind of wants to go about head high or so. Nice green shrub. Here, I'll let you guys see it online. There you go. This one here. Um, the great thing about that full sun, traditional kind of like Midwest, East Coast kind of, but, but it likes to grow here. If it's, if there's some old ones, really old ones downtown off of Mount Vernon, that kind of stuff, old Prescott, that are way taller than I am. They're like this. Generally, they're kept down to be a little bit shorter and more groomed look look to it. You can count on that to be easy color every spring. It's going to announce, it's time, plant now. And then animal, deer, rabbits, javelina, antelope, they don't eat this. They don't like the taste. It looks delicious, but they don't eat it. Okay. This one, a little bit unusual. Uh, this will be new to you for some of you colder area folks from colder areas. This is uh, Indian hawthorn or raphaelliptus. Just call it Indian hawthorn. Easier to spell. It's an evergreen shrub. This is its winter color. It gets about, I don't know, below hip high or so, kind of a mound to it. Its claim to fame, though, is it's, an ever, it's one of the few evergreens that grows in full sun that blooms with fragrant flowers. It's got bright pink flowers to it. So you're seeing all these uh, buds right here. Those are all flower buds start to take off. Grows in containers, raised beds right out there in the gardens. Takes our wind, our sun. If you feel it, it's got a waxy leaf to it, which makes it very drought hardy, very low. Again, if you're gonna kill this, it'll be from watering it too much and it just drowns. Okay. Indian hawthorn. Now let's go to more native. The native, some of you just come in, I want saguaro in my, in my yard. You cannot have it, it's too cold. They're not gonna grow up here. Actually, cacti don't, the big mistake I find rookies make, there's two. Californians bring all their, their tropical sedums over. They plant them and they vaporize in the winter. They get too cold, they turn to black mush and die. And then my Midwestern folks, they love, they, they have in their mind Phoenix. So they're taking some of those Phoenix cacti, which are really expensive. They're bringing them up and they plant and they do great in the summer. About, about, about Christmas to New Year's, they just get cold and they die to the cactus. There are very few cactus that grow up here. We grow up, there are some, yeah, I'll show you a couple of them. And I've got them here. So we've got the ones that grow up here available. But just don't go to Phoenix and buy your cactus. Did they just, agave, is that blue agave, that great big beautiful one you see in the front of designer magazines? Doesn't grow up here. I've tried and tried. Have you got one? Oh, so we got, so if you're really a hardcore gardener, you can make it go. I killed my, I killed two off in my yard. Oh, it's kind of protected. So your, your uh, artichoke agaves, like this one, this grows at the top of the Bradshaws. We've got three or four of, right, this is uh, also another name for this is century plant. This agave is super, super hardy. It goes down to minus 20 degrees. We'll never see that kind of cold. And then it's the one that has that great big flower that it's got a huge flower stalk that grows up taller than you and I up 10, 12 feet. Um, and the rumor is it blooms once every hundred years. Not really. I mean, 
I find every 15, 20 years it blooms. And then when it does go into bloom, that mother plant, the main plant, dies. So, and then it can, re, it can have pups that come out from the side, but the main plant will die. And the way this plant actually is designed, it goes, I'm going to take over this hillside. And it does it by blooming, and then it, with a real tall flower, then it falls over eventually, and the seed come out over there. So it's just plopping across the landscape at every 12-foot inter intervals. That's how it kind of grows. So that's its way it grows. So beautiful plant, does great. Don't put it where the grandkids are going to be running around and playing. It can skewer you. Does have a real poke. You could probably pinch these off, but it's just kind of, that one does grow up here. This one is a companion to that. This is it's a new chicks and hen, so hens and chicks. This is a succulent, hardy succulent. So there's hardy sedums, hardy succulents that do great up here, but not all of them. This is a huge family of plants. Make sure you're doing your research so you know what varieties will winter over for you. This one goes down to very cold climates. We use this a lot in rock gardens. It's kind of a new red color. Normally they're blue to blue green in color. And they'll put on little pups that kind of spread off to the sides, great in containers, into rock gardens. It kind of just, this is tall as it gets and it spreads like this, okay? We'll have lots of sedums here that are right for this area, that are, that are hardy for here. But it won't be, I gotta hone those Californians in. They just love all those those tropical ones, and they die every, so you're wasting all your time and money on those. So this is another one. These are, these are both sedums. These are cousins. This is Autumn Joy sedum. And sedums have real thick, they're basically like a cactus. They've got a real thick, fleshy, water-soaked type of, of leaf to it, but without the thorns. So this one I like out in my gardens. I like to track birds. So I, our backyard, it can be so so riotous, you can't hear yourself. There's so many birds, it's ridiculous. But we're gardening for them. So this is one that we put out there because my little guys, they'll come in and you'll see 20 finches on top of this one plant just, just pecking away at the foliage as a food source. Early, really late winter, early, early spring, they're using this. Then once all the other native grasses and stuff come up, the pressure comes off, it starts to elongate, gets about this tall, and then it's claim to fame Autumn Joy, see them, it's got this beautiful autumn flower to it, real bright pink to it. So you can use this plant to attract birds in into your gardens. That's how I use it. Super hardy, super tough. Not a native, but I think we should treat it like, like a native. Too many folks take lavender and they kill it. I mean, I probably, probably half the lavenders I sell die because they get overwatered. These guys do not like heavy clay soil. They like dry, crusty, crummy soil that drains really fast, sandy. They like that. My best lavenders I've ever grown is in a pot because now I can guarantee, I put potting soil in there and I can guarantee that that soil is never gonna, it's gonna, always gonna drain. So I can guarantee the kind of soil it's gonna get. Make sure that your Lavenders drain. That's the main lesson. Um, rosemary, they don't care. They'll grow anywhere. That's a tough plant. But just every yard should have one. Nice little evergreen. This will actually get about this tall, kind of mounding shape. It's got the classic blue, blue color. We'll have three or four varieties, English, French, Spanish, Lavendula, and Sweet Lavender, I think. I've, we've got quite a few in rotation. Uh, they all basically have a similar kind of flower. The hardiest of all of them are English. It's got the wispy kind of blue flower, purpley flower to it. It's kind of got a, it's more of a landscape variety. This is Spanish lavender. This is one that's got the bigger, bigger flower to it. This is the one they always take pictures of and put it on magazines. This, this is the, this is the one. It's not as tough though as the English lavenders are. Uh, French lavenders, when they make all the sachets, the, the, the harvest the, the, the foliage uh, for potpourris and stuff, it's French. It's got a little bit thicker, chubbier leaf to it, so it's got more oils in it. So there's one, there's there's a lavender for everyone. Okay. Main thing I just want to say: don't overwater it. Make sure you treat it like a native. That's why I put it over here. The most famous one here, number one selling native, are yuccas, specifically red and yellow yuccas. This is a plant that gets up about the foliage is about this high. 
the flowers will hover a couple feet above that. It's got this great big red flower. Uh, or yellow, there's, there's a couple. I've actually got several that are like this. Gets nice thick foliage to it. I brought this one because it needs to be pruned. I thought I'd share with you how to prune it. This is last year's flower. So what I would do, and I've already gone through my gardens and pruned back my yuccas, I would just take this one stem, cut it off right here, as low as I can conveniently do it, leave the foliage. You'll see why this is so robust, so native. All the, uh, the, the leaves are kind of curled, so when it rains, it gathers the rain and brings it to the heart of the plant. So it's naturally rain harvesting for itself. And then it's got a real thick, fleshy, almost like a carrot kind of, kind of white root to it, very chubby, which makes it very, very draw hardy, I mean, very tough. I would say you could get this going, get it up to size you want, and not water it again, or, or just water it way less. Because I've got probably six different varieties of yuccas over there. I'm just gonna show you one, but it's, it's a native here. Of course, yeah, let's see if I can do this without skewering myself. This is Engelman's um, prickly pear, kind of a thicker prickly pear to it. It's got a great big fruit, great big red fruit, bright yellow flower to it. It's kind of a little bit showier than some of our, our native, kind of more random prickly pears. Um, I would say don't even put this on a drip irrigation system. Just water it by hand if you happen to remember to water it. That's how you treat that. Truly, truly a native. There's several uh, types of prickly pears over there. Um, pick the one you want. There's, there's a purple one. There's, there's several. We've got clear cups, which is the uh, um, hedgehog, one that grows up in between all the rocks and stuff. There's some of those over there. But all your bigger ones down in Phoenix, they freeze out in the winter. They'll take our sun, they'll take our wind, they won't take our cold. That's the challenge. Okay. Uh, uh, let's see if I get that without getting myself. I like this one. I've got several of these in my backyard. This is silk tassel. It's an evergreen shrub. It gets up about this tall, kind of thick. You'll see this going wild. When you're out in the forest, you'll just see a great big green shrub like this. That's what this is. It's a real pretty flower to it, kind of a curly cue, flagging kind of flower to it. But if you want a robust, it's not, it's not manzanita. It sort of has that look to it, but it's more upright. I find it, it lives longer. Manzanita has a kind of a short life to it. it. tends to grow and grow and grow, and then it dies out in the middle and just kind of, once it starts dying, you can't keep it going. This one also takes more clay soil than a, than a manzanita does. So manzanita, if you look at it too wet, it will die. So put it where it is dry and draining. I've got three or four varieties of manzanita. That red bark, the one with the evergreen leaves and the red bark, that grows up here natively. Uh, we're trying to introduce more and more smaller sizes. So the great big one we've got too, Howard McMahon, but we've got Sentinel, Panchitos, and a ground cover variety. So they, they all do equally as hardy, equally as tough. This one is bigger has a, and thicker. Um, anyway, silk tassel. I thought I'd bring this, not that it's a native, but it, it acts like it, rosemary. And I brought it mainly to teach a lesson that herbs, herbs grow better here than almost anywhere else in the country. It loves the elevation, it loves the bright sun, it loves, they love the dry. And so other parts of the country where it's real humid, your, your uh, oreganos, they tend to get leaf spot, and they kind of die out in the middle, or don't do that. Time just creeps and recedes and goes and goes. Other places just kind of rots out and just dies when, in a wet cycle. Uh, not here. And the main thing with herbs is animals don't like them. I know we, this is, you could take this in the kitchen. Uh, you can actually take this and pinch it off and strip off the foliage, use it as a skewer for like chickens and pork and just the, 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 the rosemary flavor just kind of permeates from the inside out. It's like my mouth's watering thinking about it. I should have had more breakfast or something. So anyway, herbs do really great and animals don't eat them. They'll eat uh, fennel sometimes, basil, but most others, they're not gonna bother. And easy, easy to grow, full sun, so, okay. And then I'll leave you with this one. This is called Tombstone Rose. There's a 200-year-old 
rose down in the middle of town. Uh, everyone else call, in the country calls it Lady Banks Rose. In Arizona, we call it the Tombstone Rose or variations. I mean, the trunk on this thing is ginormous. Um, this is the only evergreen rose, okay? And ever, no, no thorns on it. So it's very soft. The flowers on it, you can see flower buds right here. So tiny little white, delicate flower to it. Um, it blooms for a short time, maybe a month. And then it's just a big evergreen vining plant. So I bring it just because it gets, it gets a lot of name. People know what it is. So we've got it. I think there might be better roses that bloom longer, uh, but they'll have thorns and they're not, they're not evergreen. So I guess they both have, if you want color, I've got climbing roses that would be similar in size. Um, but if you want an evergreen that's soft, I've had one of these in Skull Valley. We raised our family in Skull Valley. There's one right there at the farm. Literally, you could park your, your uh, truck underneath it. It was huge. It was like a 50-year-old bush. It just grew ginormous. So uh, I, don't, I didn't find anything anyone ate this. No, we had elk and deer. Or if they did eat it, um, it, it grew out of it and just kept on going anyway. So it's so aggressive, it's so fast growing. Probably not. They can be messy, yeah, they, they sure can. Yep, seems like personal experience. But when you're planting that, you're planting that down a barbed wire fence or up a trellis or you're planting you know, up, a, up a chain link, six foot fence, you're planting them where they tend to, where they can tend to go and grow fast. Yeah, same with pyracantha. Pyracantha is, that's an old fashioned plant. You know, as, as kids used to pick the berries off and throw them at each other. Uh, well, the other name is called Firethorn. It's got thorns on about this long, but super tough plant does really well here. And so for commercial settings, I like to put that in there because they just, you can't kill them. And kids aren't going to try to crawl up it and it's just going to, they just take care of themselves. So let me take some questions. I can keep going on and on. Uh, I guess I got to cover two. I already mentioned autumn blaze maples. Aspens, I'll just bring this one. It's not quite leafed out. doesn't quite look good, but you are in Aspen country, and then we'll take some questions, okay? So uh, Aspen Creek, you can literally walk there from here. So as, this is Aspen country. They grow, they, they're native here. Uh, as they get older, more mature, as the bark thickens, they become whiter and whiter and whiter until they're literally paper white. Okay, so these are fairly young. They're just starting to put on that white coat to them. But as it matures, the, the, the what I wanted to... The lesson I want to give you is aspens. Everyone sells aspens, but you only want to buy them from Waters Garden Center. <laughs> and here's the reason why. We're taking three bare root. We've grown them up in a field. Then we take three. We're trying to get them cookie cutter, perfectly shaped. We're trying to get uniformity for clusters. So this is how they naturally grow. They grow in clusters. Um, a lot of folks will take them and just dig them out in some ranch or some wild area. They just dig them up. And so they're kind of, they're not uniform. They may not live because you're taking all the roots. They got this wild kind of markings on them where the deer have rubbed antlers on them. Um, kind of, if you're gonna, if you're gonna have trees, spend your money in landscaping on your trees and things you wanna screen, so big evergreens. So if you've got a neighbor that looks at you every dinner Put a big pine tree or spruce or something right there. Get Buy a bigger one. Put your landscape dollar towards that to get up to size because those are slow growing things. And then trees, you want to hand pick your trees. You do not want some ugly tree because ugly trees, as they get bigger, they become uglier. They don't ever get prettier. They just go more. They get more dog leg. They get more thin they get they just you want to hand pick your trees don't let your landscapers do that you want to you can go tag come to the garden center with them hand tag make sure if you just let your landscapers do it you'll get something you're not i hear more tension with landscape companies over the trees shrubs I and mean, red tip botania that thing's a weed just put it in the ground it will grow up and you can cut your fertilize it cut, cut your way out of it it's just a massive 12 by 12 by 12 evergreen shrub these you just want to make sure just things i've seen and heard been doing this 31 years 
And boys, some, some folks get really heart, they get heartburn over, over their trees. Hand pick your trees. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so good question. So aspens, so do they actually run and come up other places? Aspens naturally want to be a family. They want to grow in, in clusters. You can buy them with single trunks, and still those roots will come up someplace. If they come up where you want it, encourage them. If they're where you don't like them growing, dig them out. Don't let them grow. So but they're naturally going to going to naturally come up. In fact, uh, aspens are some of the oldest living organisms on the planet because the same DNA from 2,000 years ago is the same exact DNA as today as you're walking through the forest because they're all just related and connected over the deck, over the millennia, they've connected to each other. So garden trivia, there you go. Okay. Questions, Q&A, what are we doing? What are the questions we got? We okay? Yeah. That's good. Actually, that's not bad. So we have a lot of leach fields or septic fields here. So if you're out in the county, you've got to provide your own septic fields. So that's really just right across the street right here. You're in the city? Oh, still, really? Okay, so you want shallow rooted things over a septic field. You do not want a great big aspen, maple, uh, big plants, not good. Because those roots will go down. They'll go for that leach field. Leach field just is big perforated pipe that you flush your toilet, goes down and just helps it seep into the surrounding soil. Well, it's gonna go for that every time because it's got fertilizer, it's got water, it's got everything it wants. And then once that root grows, it just clogs it right up. And then you have to call the plumber to rotor rooter it, it's a big pain. Plant those things at least 20, 30 feet away from, those, from that septic tank or the leach field. Um, so shorter things, grasses, Shorter shrubs, some of these smaller. If it only gets up about this big, you're probably good. So that leach field's probably six feet down. It kind of depends on the perk, but it's down. The last one I put in, I could step in and I couldn't see the top of those. It'd be dangerous to get down there, could collapse on you and kill you. It was deep. So you just want plants to stay, the roots to stay up this level. I would say fruit trees, not over. No, I, mainly because two reasons. Do you want your fruit sucking up toilet water? No, and then it might clog, especially bigger, like a big apple or, or cherries can be large. They're going to have roots that go larger. So just, I would say put them off to the side a little bit. Berries, I would say you could do. Blueberries, blackberries, raspberries would be fine. Um, I've had personal heartache over big trees that got into my leech field. So I feel, I don't want you to have that pain, that pain point like I've had, okay? Yeah, you bet. We could talk offline too with some more. Yeah. Agaves are going to be fairly short. So that I don't think they would clog things up. They've got a big root, tap root, but I don't they're not noted as being aggressive or, or lifting pavers. Some plants are just notorious for tearing things up, lifting walls. They got a long tap root. So if you're in doubt, don't plant it right over, you know, blue stake. Know where everything is, and don't plant it right over it. Just go off. Oh, in a pot. I mean, that's an. Oh. Yep. Um, I don't know how to advise you on that one. So it's hard to find a great big agave. So you'll find maybe blue agaves you can find better, but um, I don't know if I put them right over my septic. So anyway. Yeah. My battery's gonna die soon. Oh. Oh, hey. See you all later. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks so much. Hey, come down and see us. We'd rather see you in person than online. There you go.